Folks, as bittersweet as it may be, we've reached the final card of the year, UFC 296. After this, we have a month, an entire month away from the sport in which we love so much. But never fear, we can face these difficult times together. I am 138 MMA and I'm going to break down the entire UFC 296 card in its entirety for your viewing pleasure, the last of the year. And don't worry, there will be some more stuff coming out on the channel in the time that we will be away, but it just won't be full card breakdowns because there are none. So anyway, we're going to break down this whole card. For those of you who are new, you can find me on Twitter, 138MMA. You can find me on Tapology, where you can see my picking percentages and all that good stuff. Same name, 138MMA. You can also find me on Instagram. There's a little underscore between the number and the, and the letters. Uh, somebody else took it, but either way. Um, and lastly, you can find me on Patreon, patreon.com slash 138MMA, where I'll post all my notes, my uh, picks with confidence ratings, my, my bets, my, my favorite bets. I now just do my favorite bets. And then a Patreon parlay, which is a ridiculous parlay that almost never hits. Although last week we hit our regular base leg as well as the extra leg. We didn't hit the D-Gen leg, but you know what? That's a little crazy. Nobody ever hits that. Either way, uh, we've done it a couple times. But either way, all that's over there. A lot of you left after we had a bad week a couple weeks back. But guess what? We killed it again last week. It did great. A lot of people had bad weeks. We didn't. We had a good week. So that's what's going to happen. UFC 296, we're going to have a great week. I'll see you guys in the first fight. I've talked an interesting about. stylistic matchup here at Welterweight. Randy Brown takes on Muslim Salikov. Both guys were pretty good last fives. Three and two for Salikov. Four and one for Randy Brown. Uh, Randy Brown's had some close fights in that, but he's been able to come out on top in most of those. Obviously lost to JDM, but there's that. Uh, for Salikov, three and two. Not too bad for a guy that's 39 in the Welterweight division. Am I right? He's only had four losses in his entire career. At 39 at Welterweight, he's still doing pretty good. Now, he is going to be at a significant height and reach disadvantage here. He's 5'11 with a 70-inch reach. Randy Brown is 6'3 with a 78-inch reach. And being younger by six years and having all the physical advantages height and reach-wise, that is going to play a significant factor. But skill for skill, when we look at Muslim Salikov, he's the better striker. He's got a very large toolbox in the striking department. He's, he's incredibly accurate. He's got plenty of power. He's got all sorts of dynamic kicks, puts together combinations with the hands when he needs to. But the problem is his output is pretty low. And I think a lot of it is because he does not want to gas out. And so he tries to pick his shots really well. And, that, and he does do a good job with it. And when he hits you, he scores good shots, right? The kicks particularly are just deadly. But he's going to have a big, big gap to cover here. But in the wrestling, he can do that as well. He's got decent wrestling. He's got, got the ability to mix in takedowns. The takedown defense is there as well. And he's also hard to hold down. So for, for a guy like Muslim Salikov, if he decides to mix this in, maybe at the end of a round to try to steal one, he could see some success there. And I think the striking, like I said, skill for skill, he's going to be better. If you just put these guys you know, in front of a camera and said, hey, throw your prettiest striking or whatever and show me your skills, Muslim Salikov is a better striker. But Randy Brown, he's a good striker as well, and he's going to be able to use his length to be able to uh, land before Salikov and keep Salikov at distance. He does do a good job with that. The problem he does have is the lean back defense, you know, like Terror Squad, like lean back, you know, Fat Joe does what he does. It's not good when you're uh, using that as your defense as a tall guy, well, as anybody, but the tall guys use it a lot. The thing that's going for him is the output's you know, not as big for Salikov. Usually to hit those guys just doing the lean back, you can't just throw a single shot or even two shots a lot of the time. You need to put together three and four punch combinations and the third and fourth strikes are what's getting those guys when they're just leaning back, especially when they're as tall and lengthy as Randy Brown. But he does do well using his length offensively. Now, good kicks, front kicks up the middle are going to be his best friend in this because he's going to be trying to keep Salikov away, right? I was actually just teaching this on, um, on Sunday. Uh, I help, I'm helping coach an amateur fighter, right? He's, you know, coming up, looking to get his first fight probably early next year. Uh, and he's a long, rangy guy, right? He's very long and rangy for the weight class that he'll be in. And I was saying, hey, we need to get you doing, using your front kicks up the middle because that's your longest weapon without having to sacrifice position. Because if you turn for like a side kick, like a rangy, like taekwondo style side kick, you're giving up position. But... Like, you're, you're putting yourself in a bad position because you're going sideways. And if that's not your stance, and for MMA, it's not usually your stance. The front kick, though, you can snap that out front. Use the longest weapon you got is your legs and be able to hold that opponent at bay, keeping them, with, you know, at the end of your shots with your punches, things like that. He uses those front kicks well for that. I kind of over-explained that, but you'd get what I'm saying. The combinations are there. He can put stuff together. And when he's moving forward and using his combinations, he's, he's doing a lot better than when he's moving backwards. And I think Salikov's going to let him move forward in a lot of these shots, in these, these spots, I mean. Uh, 
jiu-jitsu, it's pretty good. Um, he does have those choking arms, you know what I mean? He's got the length to wrap up your limbs as well. Randy Brown's just kind of pretty good everywhere, right? I think that's going to be enough to get it done here with the, with the, the age and the physical advantages. I'm going to slightly lean Randy Brown, but I could be swayed on this one. If you have a strong lean for Salikov, give me an argument for him in the comments and let me know why, because I could maybe be swayed in this one. But as of right now, I'm going to lean on the Randy Brown side. Let me know where you're at. I'll see you guys here with some really impressive records in this matchup. But hey, real quick, go down in the comments and pick a fight with somebody down there. Let's get this algorithm going crazy, right? Go argue with somebody in the comments. That's going to get a lot of returns on your investment. You guys are going to go back and forth for a couple hours, and that's what's going to make the channel grow. Appreciate you guys. Let's break this one down. Both guys 5-0 in their last five fights. In fact, there's only one loss between the two of them, and that's on the Martin Boudet side, but that was a while back. Now, in this one here, We've got heavyweights. Budai's been around the, uh, the UFC for a bit now, uh, whereas Gaziev is coming off the Contender Series. This is his first matchup in the UFC. Uh, we've got big heavyweights with great records, but neither one's really fought the best level of competition. That's basically where we're at. Uh, for Budai, dude's got good grappling, right? He's got good grappling. He's got a very solid cage push. Now, when he gets guys up against the cage, he's just looking to keep them there, and he's just going to pepper them with little shots, hit it with a little strike, Whatever he's got to do, just to keep the fight there, doing just enough. He's a grinder by nature. If he gets the fight to the mat, sure, that's what he's going to do there too. He's just going to grind on his opponents. His whole thing is wear you, wear you out, slow you down, do whatever. Now, if he's at range, he does have power in his shots, but the output's pretty, pretty minimal. So, although he's a decent striker in general, I don't think that the, his striking is his best weapon. In fact, it's just get the guys up against the cage and grind on him. That's what he wants to do. Now, for Gaziev, this guy's a fast starter, right? But he fades really quick after that first round. And uh, pretty much everything that you see here that's good is gone outside of the power after that first round. Because he's still a big, strong guy. He still hits heavy. I mean, he's a freaking heavyweight. He's going to hit hard, right? So he's got power. He does keep his hands low. His durability is also going to fade as he gets tired because that's what happens. Like, no, he's not getting knocked out in one shot. But it's a little easier just to want to be like, ah, uh, you know? And sure, he hasn't lost yet, but he hasn't fought anybody in the UFC yet. This is his debut. In the grappling, looks fantastic in the first round. He's going to chain takedowns together. He's got great top pressure, and that ground and pound is absolutely nasty. But after the first round, it's kind of gone. And I think this fight's going late. I'm going to take Budai to probably lose the first, win the second, and win the third. That's what I think is going to happen. I think he's going to do a lot of cage pushing in the second and third, and that's what we're going to get. So Martin Budai is the pick. But let me know who you have. And don't forget to start an argument in the comments below. I appreciate it very much. I'll see so you guys look next. at a matchup at featherweight between Andre Feely and Lucas Almeida. Almeida's 3-2 and two in his last five fights. Feely is 1-3 in a no contest, which is a horrible record for the last five fights. But the level of competition that these two have been facing is quite a bit different, right? For Almeida, you know, he's coming in relatively new to the UFC. He's got a good bag of skills from what we've seen. He's very, you know, he's very much a finisher. Let's put it that way. Doesn't really go to decisions. He's good in finishes. But he hasn't fought the level of the guys that Andre Feely's been fighting. In that 1-3-1 and one, no contest, the guy's been fighting, you know, higher level dudes. Joe Anderson, Brito, Bill Algio, stuff like that. He's fighting guys that are, that are up there in the division. Not Maybe not top five, but up there in the division. So now we find out okay where is almeida well his skill set for for example his striking is a very dynamic attack he uses things like flying knees and big big movements that are very quick and powerful when he uses them and he does a good job with that and that's why he's getting a lot of finishes right um, on the ground he's attacking submissions he's very good in the jiu-jitsu department his takedown defense isn't that good though and a lot of times he tries to defend the takedowns by using more strikes works out great sometimes knock a guy out with a you know with a knee while, while he shoots in that's one big that's one thing that's one way to stop a takedown or you try to throw a strike, say you want to try and catch him with a counter hook or whatever, puts you off balance when they're trying to get your legs, and you end up on the mat. So his takedown defense isn't the best. Can work for explosive uh, knockouts that way, but, you know, whatever. Um, he's also got some pretty good submissions off of his back or in the top position, either way. Now, for Feely, veteran of the game, right? He's got good striking. He uses his length very well. Something I like about him is he's able to keep pressure on opponents while keeping them at range. And he does have pretty long wingspan, right? He's able to use that very well. Um, very effective kicks. Um, snaps him up to the head pretty well. Does a good job, you know, hitting the legs with the leg kicks. Things like that. But he is a bit hittable. And that could be a problem against a guy like Almeida. So keep that in mind. Now, the grappling. When Feely is getting his grappling going, he has a pretty darn good rep wrestler, right? He's got opportunistic takedowns. He, he finds his openings at the end of strikes 
or when his opponent is striking at him and he sees a spot to duck under, get that takedown. He does a good job with that when he hits those. He's probably going to be at his best because he's going to be able to start mixing the striking with the wrestling and the wrestling with the striking, and it's probably going to go well for him. But he doesn't always have that opportunity, or he just doesn't always use it in some of his fights. Now, scrambles, very good in the scrambles. But again, his takedown defense also isn't that great. I do think that Feely's going to be shooting more takedowns than someone like Almeida, who's going to want to keep it on the feet with the striking because that's what he likes to do. But neither of them can really defend takedowns super well. For me in this one, I'm going to slightly lean Feely. Now, maybe some of that is just me liking the, the, the fighter that is Andre Feely a little bit better, um, and we don't know enough about Almeida. But I do think if he starts getting those takedowns going, I think he's going to be able to stay safe on top. Because we're not seeing Andre Feely getting subbed left and right in, in these matchups, right? He's going, he's going to decisions with guys, losing that way. Maybe he gets dropped, whatever. But I think if he's able to mix the takedowns in and keep Almeida kind of guessing on what's going on, I think his striking is going to be good enough. I think he's going to be probably the more polished, but just the less damaging. Um, so I'm going to say I'm going to take Feely, and he's probably going to get it done by decision. But it's a close fight. Let me know what you have. Do you take the up-and-comer in Almeida who's only lost twice in his career, or do you take the guy that's lost more than that in the last five fights like I have? I don't know. Maybe I'm a doofus. Let me know. I'll next see you guys up, in the next. Flyweights in a matchup that I'm really, really looking forward to. We have Tagir Ulan-Bekov taking on Cody Durden. Both guys are 4-1 and one in their last five fights. Both of these guys are probably one of the, or two of the better prospects in the division that are not quite in that upper echelon yet of the flyweight division. For Cody Durden, dude's a solid wrestler, right? This guy's going to come forward with takedowns, and he's going to just keep shooting them. He's going to chain wrestle. He's got a crap ton of volume, and he's just relentless. He's like a dog on a bone, and he's just going to keep taking you down, getting the mat returns, and just go, 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 whether he's tired or not. And he's going to do this from the start of the fight all the way through the end. He starts very fast, and he's got an incredibly high motor, and that's what he does, right? But in the striking, the wrestling threat has started to open that up a little bit. He's got good forward pressure. He's got decent power in his striking. And when he gets inside, he's got pretty good dirty boxing. And he's durable as well. So even if he has to eat a few to get inside, that's something that he can do. For Tagiru on Bekov on the other side, dude is a solid grappler. He's got good takedowns, typically the body lock, but he can also work in his single leg. But typically the body lock, that's his best bet. Um, he's got good scrambles, but that guillotine, and that's something we've seen uh, Cody Durden caught with before, he has a very nasty guillotine, and that is something that he could use in this matchup to get the win over a guy like Cody Durden. But the thing about Durden is, in his last matchup with Jake Hadley, he was able to fight through some submissions that most people would have tapped to. That's That was not always the case for Durden, and now he's been able to add that to his game. So I do like that, but that guillotine is still nasty, and once you're asleep, it doesn't matter how tough you are. So, good striking as, for, as well for, uh, for Ulan Bekov. I think he probably is skill for skill is the better striker. He's got a very clean jab. He cuts off the cage well, and he's got good movement while he's doing that, you know, staying on the toes like that. But his striking defense isn't always the best, and sometimes it gets a little bit laxed while he's starting to, you know, stick his jab and, like, look for the takedown uh, or look to get a hold of the body lock or whatever. Uh, so, he can be hit, and I find this to be a very good matchup. I really do. I think it's one of the better matchups on the card. I think it's going to be back and forth. I think both guys are going to have some success. But ultimately, I'm going to side with Cody Durden because I think he's going to be getting more takedowns. I think he's going to be able to just put a pace on Ulan Bekov that although Ulan Bekov can keep a good pace himself, I don't think he's going to be able to keep up because I don't know that there is anybody at flyweight or at least not anybody outside the top five that can keep up with the pace of Cody Durden. So I'm taking Cody Durden to get this one done. Something else is... I, outside of his first fight, that short notice matchup with Chris Gutierrez, I've bet on Cody Durden in every single one of his UFC fights. So, you know, peek behind the curtain. I bet on him here. Plus 160 is an underdog. So fantastic. There you go. That was a freebie. The rest you can find on patreon.com slash 138MMA. But the only real time that I've been like, man, that was a bad bet, was the Makaya fight. Because they didn't last very long at all and he got wrecked. But he's been an underdog in, I think, every single one of his fights. And I've cashed on him as an underdog in every single one of his fights that he's won, which is a lot more than lost. So Cody Durden has been doing very good to the channel. Uh, I'm taking him to win here, and I'm trying not to be biased about that, but there is probably a little bit of that in there because he has done so so well for me in the past. So take that for what it is. Cody Durden's a pick. Let me know who you have. Next up, Alonzo Menefield fights Dustin Jacoby in the light heavyweight division. If you haven't done it already, folks, like this video. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Let's break this down. 3-2 and two in the last five for Jacoby. 3-1 and a draw for Menefield. Now, this is an interesting matchup here because 
It's kind of going to depend on the game plan of Medifield as to f how this fight plays out. But let's break down the skills first. High-level kickboxing on the side of Dustin Jacoby. He's fought, some of, he's fought the who's who over in kickboxing over with Glory. Uh, very talented kickboxer. He's very technically sound, good combinations. He's got the ability to counter-strike with some of the best of them. He's got a fantastic leg kick and volume with the hands to follow that up. Uh, with, the, with the takedowns, he's got good takedown defense, and that wasn't there his first stint into MMA. He was he went away from kickboxing for a bit, came to MMA, struggled a lot with the takedown defense, then went back to kickboxing where they don't do takedowns, and then he seemed to improve his takedown defense in that time away. He came back, has pretty good takedown defense now. Now what he does is he stuffs the takedown and then just strikes right away, not giving guys a chance to reshoot on him, stuffs it and just starts striking with him, and he does a good job with that. Now for Menefield. Dude's a decent striker, right? But it's mostly just raw power and speed because he throws a lot of single shots and he is a bit wild. But if he hits you, it's going to hurt. Now, sometimes he'll put together a combination, but still, a lot of them are single shots. But if he hits you, like I said, it's going to hurt. Now, good wrestling. He's got very powerful slams to get guys to the mat. He's got good top pressure and the ground and pound is absolutely devastating. He's got a very tight squeeze when he gets a hold of your neck as well. The thing about Alonzo Menafield, though, he's a very... Uh, highly athletic individual, but he will slow. Now, the first round, great. Second round, still got a lot of it. But at the end of that second round into the third, he's going to fade quite a bit. I was, because of the odds, I was this close to taking Menafield because I understand that he has a very good chance to win this fight, especially if he comes in with a wrestling-heavy game plan. I just know that I can't trust him to do that because he's going to have to do that for three rounds. I don't think he gets Jacoby out of there. I don't think he gets him down on the first takedown attempt either. So then it becomes a striking matchup. And if you're striking with a guy like Dustin Jacoby, I think you're going you're gonna to lose the volume battle if you're Alonzo Metafield. You're going to lose the, uh, the technique battle because he, he's going to be getting there first, right? Because Dustin Jacoby's got cleaner, straighter, to-the-point shots. And I think he's going to get to the target first. Now, so now what does Metafield have to do? He has to make it ugly. And I think Jacoby's just going to be a little bit too bad. Too, too clean in the striking to allow someone like Menafield to do that. But if Menafield gets the, gets the wrestling going early, gets a big powerful slam in that first round and just starts with that nasty ground and pound and doesn't give Jacoby a chance to settle in, that's where he can win this fight. I am going to take Dustin Jacoby, though. It's not the most confident pick on the card. Like I said, those odds almost had me. But I do think that the striking is going to get it done for him. But let me know where you're at. I'd love to hear from you. Flyweights are next. Casey O'Neill takes on Ariane Lipsky. Three and two in the last five for Lipsky, four and one for O'Neill. Lipsky's looked pretty darn good in her career as of late. She's got a couple of wins over some pretty good competition. And uh, for O'Neill, the lone loss in her entire career comes with Jennifer Maya, who's a pretty gosh darn good talent at the flyweight division. So interesting bit of uh, bit of events leads us to here. O'Neill's been a little bit inactive lately. She's had some injuries, things like that. It was her knees uh, for Lipsky. A little bit more active, and in fact, she's come through as an underdog in her last couple of matchups and done a good job of it. So, when we look at the skills, uh, Ariane Lipsky, good striking, she's got solid kicks, and she strikes in flurries a lot of times, and then single shots, flurries and single shots. And I do like that. Uh, when it's when someone just throws single shots, I'm not a big fan. But if you come through with a flurry, and then mix in with a single shot here and there, it changes what your opponent opponent expects. If they if you Get them biting on single shots, and they're, they're thinking, oh, I can counter. But then a flurry comes out of nowhere. That second and third strike's going to land, and they're going to be able to you know, not defend it because they're trying to think of that counter, and they thought you were throwing a single shot. Also, if you're throwing a lot of flurries, and then you start throwing a single shot, you get them trying to counter your second and third shot, and instead it's not there, and then you get to see what they're trying to throw next in, in uh, counter to your flurry or whatever. I don't know how much she's really going into all that, but she does a good job with what she does on the striking. She's a very uh, very violent person when she gets gets to landing strikes on people. And the same can be said for her jiu-jitsu. She has some nasty submissions. We've seen it before, but she can be stuck on bottom. It's a problem. It's a big problem in this matchup particularly. And also, she's kind of just inconsistent throughout her career. Now, lately, she's looked good. But in the past, she's been a little bit back and forth, right? On the Casey O'Neill side. The wrestling, that's the thing that makes makes you worry when you're looking at the Ariane Lipsky side because she can get stuck on bottom. Casey O'Neill's got good top control. Casey O'Neill, she 
when she is very aggressive, whether it's on the feet or in the grappling, she's aggressive to come forward. She's going to throw volume on the feet. The one, two, typically just boom, boom, just moving, walking people down. And then she's going to try to get that takedown and she can muscle it down if she needs to. But once she gets on top, she's pretty good there. She's got a good sweep from the bottom. I don't think she's going to need it here. If the fight hits the mat, she's going to be the one on top most likely. And that's, that's the thing. I think she's going to be able to get on top of Ariane Lipsky. And if Lipsky doesn't get a sub, I think she's going to be in a bad way and she's going to lose minutes. On the feet, I think the, I think the better striking is Lipsky. And I think she can, she can win moments on the feet. I just think we're going to see a lot of time where Casey O'Neill's on top. I wanted to pick Lipsky. In fact, I even threw two and a half, or not two and a half, to 0.25 units on her. If you're on the Patreon, you saw that, but kind of cashed out the bet because darn it, I knew that it was a bet that I was doing because I wanted to see Lipsky come through as an underdog yet again. So we're taking Casey O'Neill. I think she's just going to be able to get her down and stay on top and stay safe enough. So that's where I'm at. But let me know what you have. If you can sway me to the Lipsky side, I would appreciate it very much. So if you are on Lipsky, let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you guys. Band and weight matchup here. Cody Garbrandt takes on Brian Kelleher. Both guys are two and three in their last five fights. Both guys have kind of been around a while, had some some things, right? So had some moments, had some uh, some tough losses. For Brian Kelleher, the guy's got good striking. He's going to come forward with his combinations. He's going to pr uh, predominantly be a boxer in the striking and in the grappling. He's got a nasty guillotine. That's what he goes to. He goes to that guillotine a lot. He's got good scrambles. His takedown defense isn't the best, and a lot of times he can be held down because he's uh, constantly looking for submissions rather than working his way back to his feet. Now, for Cody Garbrandt, he's a solid striker, right? Got fantastic boxing, good footwork, speed, power combinations. The dude's fantastic when he's on, but his durability has faded quite a bit in his career, especially recently, right? And... Uh, his, he doesn't really do the best to keep his hands up because, well, he's been able to use that durability that he had early in his career, you know, use his head movement, get out of the way, and then when he did get hit, it wasn't a big deal, but now that's kind of gone away. So the durability's gone down. He's wrestling. He's got good wrestling, right? He has a wrestling background, wrestling in high school, all that good stuff, good takedowns, good scrambling ability, good takedown defense, but he's more of a striker in his MMA career. That's where he, what he's been doing in the UFC. We did see him go to the wrestling in his last match and get the win that way. Brian Kelleher is coming off of neck surgery, I do believe, and that's not something that you like to see. Cody Garbrandt, well, he got a win in his last fight, but before that he was getting knocked out quite a bit. This is a tough fight. Tough one to pick. Uh, either guy could get this one done. It's another one where, you know, maybe you just kind of kick back, crack open a nice cold root beer, kick your feet up on the coffee table, and have a, have a nice watch because this is a tough one. But I'm going to lean Cody Garbrandt. Because I think maybe, maybe he's going to do what he did last time and go for the takedowns. And if he does and not get guillotined, I think he can stay safe enough on top that Kelleher's going to start looking for submissions off of his back and not get them in time and just kind of run out of time in the match. And I think that's what's going to happen is Garbrandt's going to get a decision. But I could be wrong. Could be a striking matchup and then who knows what happens. But I'll take Garbrandt with the lowest amount of confidence. Let me know where you're at and I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Next See up, you Irene next. Aldana takes on Carol Hosa in the 135 pound bantamweight division. Both of these ladies are three and two in their last five fights. There is a bit of a height and reach advantage on the Aldana side. She is 5'9 with a 68 and a half inch reach as opposed to the 5'5, 67 and a half inch reach. And we're going to get into why that is important in a minute. But let's break down the skills here. Okay, so Aldana, primarily a boxer. Carl Hosa, a little bit more of a more of a striker than 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 anything, but uh, kind of just puts it all together, right? She's more of an all-arounder. She's got decent striking. She's got good volume, and the leg kicks are one of the better things that she does use. Now, I like leg kicks against a boxer because what do boxers do? Well, they're usually heavier on the front leg because they're using that boxing style, moving their head and throwing combinations with the hands, and not thinking about their lead leg as much. So the leg kick there, pretty good. What I don't like is the striking defense. The striking defense isn't that good. When you're going against a good boxer, that's a problem. Uh, she does have decent grappling, though, and if she gets on top, I think she's going to have a lot of success. But if she ends up on the bottom, I don't think she's going to have very much success because she's got good top pressure, not so good off her back. Very much similar on the Aldana side, but she is more active off of her back, but she can be held down and doesn't really do a whole lot there. Now, when it comes to her striking, she's the better striker, I would say, but it's primarily boxing. Now, she'll mix in leg kicks, and she's got pretty good leg kicks, but... She's got good power in the hands, not like knockout power per se, but she can she can knock you down or she can get the 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 knockout from 
the shots, but it's not like a put you out cold type of knockout. It's the, oh, you've been hit enough and now you're down type of knockout, right? Uh, she's got good volume, good combinations, and her footwork is there. The thing that makes this important though is she's going to be going to be beating Hosa to the strike, right? The, the, the power and the volume from Aldana is going to be coming in with that longer reach and height, so she's punching down as well. And I think that's going to be a big difference in the striking. Now, if Hosa's able to get a couple takedowns, she might be able to win the fight that way. But I do think Aldana gets it done here. I'm taking Irene Aldana in this matchup. Let me know who you have. And I will see a you short next. notice matchup here that I think is much better than the original. Out is Giga Chikadze. In is Thug Nasty Bryce Mitchell. Taking this fight on maybe 9 or 10 days notice or whatever. Uh, in his last five fights, he's four wins, one loss, that only loss being to Ilya Taporia. He's facing Josh Emmett, who is three and two in his last five fights. One of those losses is also to Ilya Taporia. The other is to Yair Rodriguez. But that Ilya Taporia is the common opponent in the last five fights. Very interesting there. Now, Bryce Mitchell is a young up-and-coming prospect at only 29 years old with only a single loss in his career. That's fantastic. Josh Emmett is a guy who's 38 years old in the featherweight division who's been around for a while but only suffered four losses in his entire career. That is also fantastic. So both of these guys still doing it at a, at a good rate. You know, three and two when you're fighting the highest level in the last five fights, that's pretty impressive. Now for Bryce Mitchell, the dude's a grappler, but it's, he's such a good grappler that it's going to set up his striking. The guy, he's just a decent striker in general. His kicks are very good. He can put them up to all levels, uh, the head kick in particular. But the grappling threat will open up the hands. It'll make it so he doesn't have to worry too much about throwing his kicks because a lot of people who are kickers, they worry that if they throw a kick and it gets caught, they get taken down. Well, Bryce Mitchell doesn't care if you take him down because he's probably going to be better than you on the mat because he's better than most people on the mat. In fact, in the even in the Teporia fight in which he uh, he said that he was sick, he still had some success on the in the grappling exchanges in that matchup. Now, it was very little success. He got beat pillar to post in that matchup. But when he did have success, it was in the grappling against Teporia, who's a very solid grappler in his own right. So the grappling is such a big threat from Bryce Mitchell that it opens up the hands. It makes the kicking game just a little bit more dangerous because you know he does not care if you try to take him down off of this. So that helps. Now, for the grappling itself, dude's got a massively large toolbox. He's got all sorts of submissions, all sorts of different ways to get you to the mat, different, different techniques to pass to different positions, whatever. His transitions are excellent. He can scramble with the best of them. He's going to chain wrestle you, and he's going to do whatever he can to get you to the mat. When he gets you down there, he's a good back taker, and once he gets to your back, you're not getting rid of him. But also, he's going to chain his submission attempts together, whether that be you know triangle to armbar to whatever, or rear naked choke to an armbar, which is a good one. Um, he's got all sorts of different options that he can go to in those submission in that submission game, even going to a twister. We saw it. He's done it before. Either way, Bryce Mitchell, fantastic on the ground. Now, he's fighting Josh Hammett. Josh Emmett is no slouch on the ground either. He's got good wrestling, and he uses it mostly defensively. He's got good takedown defense, and the best thing about him is he does not accept bottom position. So if he does get taken down, which inevitably he probably will unless he ends this fight very early on the feet, he's going to fight his way back to his feet with the be or to the best of his abilities. He's not going to accept bottom position. And he's got the cardio to go five rounds, so in a three-round matchup, you don't have to worry about him just being tired and just laying on the mat because he's too tired. So Josh Emmett's going to fight to get back to his feet because he knows that on the feet, that's where he's going to have the advantage because he's a solid striker who's going to establish his jab and he's got a ton of power. Now, I know a lot of people are going to tell you this. They're all going to say, oh, Josh Emmett doesn't have much power because he hasn't knocked anybody out in ages, whatever, this, that, and the other. But power isn't just knockouts, guys. Power is not just knockouts. Let me tell you that one more time. Power isn't just knockouts. What it means is Josh Emmett is knocking guys down. And knockdowns are just as much a, a measure of power as knockouts because a knockdown can lead to a ground and pound finish. A knockdown leads to 10-8 rounds. A knockdown, a knockdown is a very important thing to do on the feet. And if you're not knocking people dead with one shot, hey, it's featherweight. Not a lot of guys do that. But Josh Emmett, he's got plenty of knockdown power. And if he cracks Bryce Mitchell, he could easily knock him down in this matchup. Now, he's got good volume as well, and he cuts the cage off while doing that. And the volume mostly comes from his jab, right? He's pumping that jab, establishing it early. He's cutting the cage off while he's doing it, backing you up to the cage so he can really start landing on you. I um, mean, he's going to work the body as well. So as he's jabbing high, you know, he's getting you going on the jab. Then he's going to start ripping low with them, those, you know, those hooks to the body, uppercuts to the body, things like that, as he gets you backing up. So Josh Emmett is probably the better striker here, just skill for skill. Now we got to decide who's going to be able to implement their game. For that, give me Bryce Mitchell. I think he's going to get this one done. We're rolling with Thug Nasty on this one. I think he's, he's well, I definitely know he's younger. So the young, the youth, sure, he's taking it on short notice. I don't think that, that Bryce is out there just 
being, you know, weak in his cardio or in his training. I think he's out there doing what he's got to do. And we know that if he gets the fight to the mat, his grappling is just next level. So I'm going to take Bryce Mitchell in this one. It's a good fight, though, and I wouldn't fault you for being on the Emmett side. But let me know where you're at. I'll see you guys in well, the next Well, to next. Ian Gary, Vicente Luque. Does anybody actually like Ian Gary? I can't stand this guy. He's super, super annoying. I caught myself there. Super annoying. But that leads me to a question. What other channels on YouTube, in the, in the space that I'm in, the YouTube MMA breakdown space, do you not like? Do you find super annoying? But also, who do you like? But let me know who you don't like, because I also want to know, because I don't want them on my channel. But we are looking for a guest for the UFC 297 panel. I've already got one lined up. I've got a couple others in mind that I'd like to reach out to. But me and the Couch Warrior, if you didn't know Couch Warrior Podcast, we're going to be on his channel for UFC 296. We've already got the guests lined up for that one. That is going to be a blast. You can find it on the Couch Warrior Podcast channel on YouTube. But mine is going to be, it's going to be back on my channel for UFC 297. Because that's what we do. We switch back and forth. I got the odd numbers. He's got the even numbers. That's how it works. I'm an odd one. He's a little bit more even keeled. That's how we hash that out. At least that's what I'm going to go with. Either way, I need more guests for those. Not necessarily for 297, but for 299, you know, 301, etc. And like I said, I've got a guest for 299 already, but we need one more because it's me, Couch Warrior, and two guests. Uh, you might have caught the one we did a while back with me and my buddy T-Dub, uh, Couch Warrior, obviously. We had Brady He Stand on there, which is freaking sweet and none other than any action effie if you haven't met him and if you haven't seen his channel you're silly go check him out i'm just i'm just i'm just ranting here a little bit but guys tell me what channels you like who do you like in the space that i can maybe talk to or who do you not like because i want to know who you don't like because there's a lot of real big turds in this space that i don't like either and you guys probably know who they are maybe you don't they probably know who they are if they don't they haven't been listening but either way let me know well let's break down this fight ian gary reminded me of that and that's where we're at so Ian Gary takes on Vicente Luque, 3-2 and two for Luque, 5-0 and oh for Gary. Gary's a slick striker, right? That's, that's what he is. He's a slick striker, very accurate, puts together good combinations, and he strikes to all levels. Whether that be the kicks to all levels, mixes up the punches to the body and the head, doesn't really punch to the leg, that'd be weird. But, I mean, some guys do it, but I don't know why. Either way, the biggest drawback for Gary is that he leaves his chin exposed when he's exiting the pocket. Like, he'll come in, land his shots, and for whatever reason, he's like, okay, I'm going I'm to step back out of the pocket now, and he'll do it like this. And just leaving that chin right up there, and that's when he gets cracked. We saw Hassan Kanan do it. We saw uh, friggin' uh, Gabe or whatever do it. Um, Green, there we go. Uh, he was able to do it. He's been cracked when he's exiting the pocket before, and that's just something that's that's not going to be, um, that he hasn't really fixed yet, okay? Uh, against Luke, that's a problem, but it's there. And his offense is great, but that defense, is there's a big hole in it. Now, in the grappling, he's got a judo background, and it works really well for him to be able to mix the takedowns in when his opponents are thinking strikes. He's got guys thinking about the strikes because he has very good striking, and then as soon as he's like, okay, I need to get that takedown, boom, right there. They're thinking, they're thinking he's coming in with a one-two head kick, and he comes with a one-two, shoots a takedown. One-two gets the body lock and drags him to the mat, something like that. So Ian Gary's very good at mixing those in. Uh, for Luke, though, Luke is a heck of a striker as well. He's got a ton of power. And he's got a good ability to counter strike. And that lead hook, the lead hook, which is going to be right here, is a serious possibility for him to land and connect in this fight. Puts together combinations as well. He's got a good killer instinct because once it gets to the mat, he's going down there and he's going to start slamming that ground and pound on his opponents. And if Ian Gary decides to shoot a nail time takedown after getting cracked, he's probably getting caught in a darst choke because what happens is Luke usually presses guys forward and just backs them up. Yes, he can mix in his own takedowns, but a lot of times he gets them to try to get you know overwhelmed with the pressure, shoot a takedown, and get darsed up. I want to pick Luke in this, but I know I'd only be doing it because I think Ian Gary's super annoying, so I'm not going to. But I am going to play the spread, and I'm going to give you that one for free because I do think Luke is going to crack him and steal a round off him, and I think it's going to go to decision, and I think we're going to get Ian Gary winning 29-28 over Vicente Luque. But if Luke wins, I'll be ecstatic and I'll be happy I get the fight wrong. I would much rather see Luke get the win. Ian Gary's super annoying. We all know he's super annoying. But if you're an Ian Gary fan, let me know in the comments. And let me know what you like about this guy. Because I can't seem to find anything other than he's, you know, a pretty good fighter. I don't know. Whatever. Let me know. See you guys Tony in the next Ferguson, Patty Pimblett. Lightweights here. The veteran versus the up-and-comer. The young 28-year-old prospect versus the 39-year-old grizzled veteran. The 5-0 last five prospect versus the 0-5 on the way out veteran. That's what we have here. Now, when you look at these guys on paper, if you were just to look at their resumes, look at their skills, things like that, it might not paint the whole picture because 
although both are talented, Tony Ferguson's been around for a long time in the UFC, and he's beaten some of the best of the best, whereas Patty Pimblett's kind of just burst onto the scene and got a couple of wins, but a lot of the guys he's got wins over aren't really in that, that higher-rated tier, right? So for Patty Pimblett, he's a good striker, not great, not poor, just good, uh, good combinations. He's going to put them together as he comes forward. He's got plenty of power in the hands, but his striking defense is terrible. He's just pretty durable, so that helps him out with that. Now, he's better on the, in the grappling, right? He's got good scrambles. He's an excellent back taker, and he's got a lights-out rear naked choke. If he gets this fight to the mat, I think he can keep up with Tony Ferguson because he's younger, he's going to be quicker, and he's got the skills to back it up. Now, when it comes to Tony Ferguson, dude's a solid striker with a ton of volume. The guy's got great combos, and he has very damaging elbows. It's one of his best uh, weapons is those elbows where he just slices you up. If you don't believe me, go back and watch the fight with Anthony Pettis where poor Anthony Pettis probably lost, I don't know, a gallon of blood in there. I'm, sure, I'm surprised the guy was still alive. But he lost so much blood in that matchup because Tony Ferguson just kept slicing him up, hitting him with those elbows. It was gnarly. Now, in the grappling department, he's got an excellent sprawl so he can keep the fight on the feet. Fantastic submission game. In fact, one of the things is after the sprawl, he can go to the Darce choke, which he's very, very good with his Darce chokes. Good scrambles, excellent sweeps, and the ground and pound of whether he's on top or on the bottom, he's got elbows slicing you up yet again. Now, on paper, Tony Ferguson is better than Patty Pimblett pretty much everywhere. Problem is, he's on a very clear decline. He's not the same Tony Ferguson that we know. He's a big losing streak, zero and five in the last five fights. And unfortunately, I have to side with Patty Pimblett here because I think he's going to be able to just be younger, more physical, and I just don't think Tony Ferguson's quite where we want him to be. And I understand that, like, oh, yeah, he's losing some of the best guys, but he hasn't looked that good. And the Nate Diaz fight is the one that really bothers me because, like, he looked real off in that fight. I'm going with Patty Pimblett. I know he's coming back after foot surgery. I think it's probably going to help him because it sounds like that was a problem for him, the, the, the foot injury, uh, for a little while now. So I'm going to take him in this one, but I'll probably pass. This is a fight where I'm just going to kick back, put my feet up on the coffee table, crack open a nice cold root beer, and just sit back and kind of wonder where the UFC is going with this and wonder where, where these two fighters are going to end up and just watch because ah, this one, this one scares me a bit. But let me know who you have. Are you on the Ferguson side? And if you are, let me know why. And if you're on the Patty Pimblett side, let me know down below as well. I'll see you guys next up. Shavkat Rachmanov takes on Stephen Thompson in the welterweight division. Obviously, Rachmanov is 5-0 in the last five because he's undefeated at 17-0 as a prospect. Thompson, 3-2 in his last five fights, coming off of a great performance against Kevin Holland. He is 40 years old, though, so keep that in mind. He's going up against the 29-year-old prospect. Like I said, Shavkat is 17-0. This is everything the UFC wants in a prospect. 17-0, 29 years old, can't get much better than that. But Stephen Thompson is a very, very tricky veteran. As you can see, there's a lot of notes here. So let's break this one down, right? Let's break this one down and let's go into a little bit of depth in the striking of Stephen Thompson because he's an incredibly high-level striker. He's got fantastic range control. He stays light on his toes while darting in and out, and he gets in and out very quickly. He's very hard to, hard to pin down. He's got great lateral movement. And he, can, he can do all these things from either stance. He's got good combinations, and he, they come from fast, different angles. Whether, you know, whether it's something that's coming off the lead leg, and he's coming up with the hands, or he's coming off the, the rear leg, or whatever. He's quick on all of these things. He's got top-tier kicks with either leg, whether they're from the front or the back, doesn't matter what stance, and you can put them anywhere in a combination. What do I mean by anywhere in a combination? Well, you can start a combination with a kick, he can end the combination with a kick. But even better is he can put a kick mid-combination. Say he throws like the one, the two, uh, you know, head kick into a two again and then throws another kick. It doesn't matter. He can mix this stuff. I'm just making stuff up. But either way, he can put his kicks anywhere in combination because he has superb balance and footwork. Great counters. Very durable. And a lot of that's because of his recovery. When he gets hit, he's back to good to go in no time. Very uh very reminiscent of somebody else we're also going to see on this card in the uh, main event. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But very durable, very quick to recover. Stephen Thompson is a fantastic striker. And skill for skill, he's a better striker than Shavkat Rachmanov. And I do believe that. Maybe I can be proven wrong this weekend, but I do believe he's the better striker. Now, when it comes to the grappling, Thompson is not the best on the mat once it hits there in, in comparison to some of the other guys at the highest level in the Welshman division. But he's got good takedown defense. 
And he does say stay safe if he is taken down, right? He's hard to really submit or just ground and pound because he's really good about just kind of doing what he needs to do to stay safe. Um, he, he does have pretty good initial takedown defense, and he's very good at when guys get into the cage, getting that, that overhook and turning into the cage, getting his opponent to the cage and then circling off. He does a good job with that. Um, so I do like his initial takedown defense, and I think he's pretty good there, but the problem is once he does get some matting, he can be flattened out. Uh, another thing I want to mention about Wonder Boy is his cardio. Excellent cardio. He's got some of the best cardio in the entire division. The guy can go. The guy could go ten rounds, no problem. I wouldn't want to, but he sure could. Stephen Thompson is a fantastic striker. Even at the age of forty, he still has all these skills. Now, when it comes to Shavkat, he's also a very good striker, right? He's solid. He's got plenty of power. Kicks to all levels and very dynamic kicks at that. Whether they're spin kicks, kicks up the middle, kicks around the outside, doesn't matter. He's got them all. He can put everything together in combinations with the hands. He is somewhat hittable at times. We've seen it. I should have brought that up there. We've seen it before, especially in the Jeff Neal fight. Now, if you remember the Jeff Neal fight with Stephen Thompson, that one, well, Thompson looked pretty good in that matchup. Now, Shavkat got the finish, but it was a grappling finish. Thompson outstruck him. Jeff Neal was able to land some really good shots on, Shav shots on Shavkat. Wow, that was hard to say. But it's because when Shavkat was in there just exchanging with him, he did start to drop his hands a little bit. And that is a problem if he's going against Stephen Thompson. Now, do I think that he can, can hold his own in the striking? For brief moments, yes. But if he tries to strike with Stephen Thompson for three rounds, he's probably going to lose. Because I don't think anybody can strike in this division anyway, can strike with Stephen Thompson for three rounds. I don't think there's anybody. But Shavkat's got a solid clinch game. He can get into the clinch, and from there, he lands devastating knees and elbows, damages you, gets you going, you know, backed up against the cage even. He's got good throws and trips from there, and that's where he can start working his game. Because if he starts doing those throws and trips, that's where he can get the fights in the mat. He's not shooting a lot of double legs and things like that. He, he probably can, but he doesn't do a ton of them. The throws and the trips are more where he gets the takedowns. When he gets the fights in the mat, he's attacking submissions. So also attacks him from the feet, apparently, um, like he did with Jeff Neal. But he got good scrambling ability, and he's, he's, just, he's good everywhere is the thing. I'm going to take Shavkat because, I mean, everybody's taking Shavkat. It's just what happens. I'm taking Shavkat Rockman on to win, but I probably, I might throw a bet on Steven Thompson at this point just because the odds are ridiculous. And I think if, if Shavkat goes out there, especially in the first round, I think he's going to go out there and try to strike with Steven Thompson. I think Thompson's going to get the better of him in that first round. After that, I think Shavkat's going to think, oh, that was a stupid idea. I probably need to start using my grappling because this guy is a better striker than I thought. And that's going to be a problem. And then, then Shavkat's going to be able to mix in the grappling, whether it be in the clinch or on the ground. And maybe this tide starts to turn his way. But I, I do think that there is a path for Stephen Thompson here in a three-round fight, especially he's only got to get two rounds, survive the third. And if Shavkat goes out there and tries to strike with him, he's going to be in trouble. So I'm going to take Shavkat, but I can see Thompson pulling off the upset because, man, can this guy still strike. But let me know where you're at. Let me know who you have. We're all rooting for Wonder Boy, I think. Like, right? I mean, who isn't rooting for Wonder Boy? Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Right, the co-main event of the evening. And guys, this is my moment real quick to tell the channel members how much I appreciate them. That $2.99 you spend per month just really supports the channel. Helps me get more markers for this sweet marker board we got here. It helps me keep the lights on. Helps me get the upgraded microphones or whatever and all the different things. So, thank you, channel members. That money goes directly towards supporting the channel and help me get more stuff that is needed to make this channel grow. So thank you guys. You get a cool little badge next to your name down in the comments. Shows how long you've been supporting the channel. You're going to get cool emojis that you can use. All that good stuff. All of you that have done it, thank you so much. You're keeping the lights on. Keep that in mind, and you're helping me out a lot. Now, let's break down this fight. It is the flyweight championship between Alexandre Pantoja and Brandon Royval. Brandon Royval, three and two in his last five. Getting a title shot, though, because he's got some impressive wins, and he's done so with very impressive fashion. Uh, for Pantoja, 4-1 in the last five. Looked pretty gosh darn good as of late, especially when he beat the former champion, Brandon Moreno, in their last matchup. Came through as a big underdog, for, well, a decent-sized underdog for us. So that was exciting. Now, this one here, these guys have fought before. This is a rematch, but the, the size advantage is going to be on the Roy Vall side. 5'9", 70, with a 70 and a half inch reach as opposed to 5'5", five, five, 68 or 68 inch reach. Sorry about that. Anyway, this is interesting because, like I said, this is a rematch. Pantoja won the first one pretty impressively with a rear naked choke in the second round. But, Royval had his moments. And Royval is one of those fighters that always is going to have their moments unless, you know, it's like that 
Moreno fight where his arm popped out right away or whatever, but or something like that. But yeah, no, typically Roy Vall is going to have his moments because he's a very good striker, but what makes him a good striker is the chaos that he brings. He's got good volume and a wide variety of attacks, knees, elbows, spins, just chaotic madness. And he's, he does well when he ends up in a brawl and he ends up in them quite often. So for Roy Vall, making it chaos on the feet is a way that he can win this matchup. But it also is a spot where he's been dropped before. He can get dropped in that chaos, rocked, rattled, knocked down, arm pops out, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, in the jiu-jitsu, he's got a slick submission game, but oftentimes he's doing it from his back. He's very much submission over position. So even if he does have a good position, a lot of times he'll lose that looking for that submission, but he's aggressively, aggressively attacking those submissions. And that's what makes him so dangerous on the mat. Um, he do doesn't have the best takedown defense either because a lot of times when guys shoot in on the takedown, He's looking for submissions. So for Roy Vall, it's pretty much all offense, no defense, and you like that. He's a fun fighter to, to watch. I'm a big fan of Brandon Roy Vall, but he's fighting a guy in Alexander Pantoja, who I don't know how you can't be a fan of this guy as well. He's got great striking. He's going to be coming forward. He's going to work the body. He's got an excellent calf kick. He can snap those kicks up to the body. Like I said, he works that body, but he's got good, clean, straight shots. Just boom, boom, nice, right down the pipe. Kind of makes up for that lack of reach that he's going to have in this matchup. And with a 68-inch reach for a guy that's 5'5", that is actually a pretty good wingspan. He just doesn't have the 70-and-a-half-inch reach that uh, Brandon Royval has. So there is that. Now, he's got excellent grappling. When he gets to the mat, although Royval is very good in the jiu-jitsu, I think Pantoja is going to be a step ahead. We, we saw that in the last one, right? He's got good ground and pound. He's an excellent scrambler. The transitions are there. But when he takes your back, it's all over for you. He's either going to get that rear naked choke, in which he is a specialist, or he's going to hold you there for as long as he needs to hold you there. For me, I have to go with Alexandre Pantoja. He won the first fight. He's only gotten better since then. I think he is just at a level right now that a guy like Brandon Royval, although very dangerous, is going to struggle outside of those moments of chaos. So I'm going to take Alexandre Pantoja. I like him to win this fight. But let me know who you have in the co-main event, and I'll see you guys in the main event. And here we go with the main event of the evening, folks. And this is your last reminder to like this video. It's just below the screen where you see the video. Scroll on down, hit like. It's fantastic. Hit join while you're down there. You can become a channel member. This is the main event, guys. It is fantastic. We've got Colby Chaos Covington challenging for the welterweight championship of the world when he fights Leon Rocky Edwards, who happens to be the champion after beating Kumaro Usman in back-to-back -back matches to take the title and then defend the, ch the title as well. Now, this is an interesting matchup because Covington, 3-2 in his last five fights, the two losses both coming to Kumaro Usman. 4-0 oh, and 1-0 no contest for Leon Edwards. Two of those wins coming against Kumaro Usman. But the Usman that they both faced is a little bit different, right? The, first, the Usman that Leon Edwards faced in their first matchup was a little closer to what you saw in the Colby Covington fights. And he was doing pretty well, but, you know, until he wasn't. In the, re or in the, the, the third fight between the two, but the, the second one, you know, for the title, Usman didn't look the same. And was that because Leon Edwards is so much better or because Usman was fading? And that's what we don't know for sure. Usman looked pretty good against Chimaev when he went up there, but that was a middleweight short notice. That was... It, there's a lot that goes into it, and styles do make fights, and sometimes that's just where you end up. So we're going to break this one down, and we're going to check it all out. Now, Edwards, he's going to have a height and reach advantage. He's 6'2 with a 74-inch reach as opposed to the 5'11", 72-inch reach of Covington. Not a big difference, but when you're the striker, that, that bit of range that you have, that little bit extra, going against a guy that wants to get takedowns, that's a big deal. So he's going to be able to use that well to get his, uh, get his striking going and land before Covington's able to close distance. We're going to start on the Covington side here. He is a strong wrestler. Here's what he does. He wrestles with an extremely relentless pace. He's just going to go for takedowns, a wide variety of them at that, and he's just going to have a ton of volume on those takedowns. Just takedown after takedown after takedown after takedown. And if he gets you down and you start to get back up, he's going to go with a mat return, and he's just going to keep on doing it. He's hard to take down in his own right. If you start to shove him off and like create distance, he's going to scramble very well. If he keeps you up against the cage and can't get the takedown, guess what? He's going to grind on you there like he did to Masvidal. Held him there for the better part of the fight, five rounds essentially. Uh, just that's what he does. He's just gonna grind you out. He's gonna keep working, working against the cage, and he's just gonna do what he has to do. When he does get it to the mat, we haven't seen it as much lately because he's been fighting the top level competition, and a lot of these guys aren't letting him get to the mat and start landing volume. But when he does, he's got very good ground and pound, and the elbows are fantastic from the top position. But 
when when these guys are just fighting back to their feet, Covington's not going to get tired because he's got the best cardio in the entire UFC. I don't care what anybody says, that, and that includes Marab. I think Covington's got the best cardio in the UFC, and I think he's going to be able to keep that pace of that just rest, relentless wrestling throughout this entire fight unless Leon can stop him from doing so by knocking the guy out because that's about it. Because if you don't knock him out, he's going to keep doing it. Um, and we saw that in the Usman fights that he had. He just kept on coming, and no matter what Usman did, Covington was pushing that action, right? And the striking, he's got good striking. It's not great. It's not fantastic. It's not super polished, but it's good for what it does or for what it is. He's got good forward pressure and a ton of volume, and he uses these things together, just coming in with that volume just to get to that takedown. Because what he does is he uses those strikes to lead into the takedown, something that, that a lot of fighters lack, that he'll just one, two, one, two, one, two, drop levels, boom. And it's so hard to keep your hands down to defend the takedown when you're just eating one, two, one, two, one, two up in the face because you're not you're not thinking, oh, shoot, I need to guard my face because this guy's punching. I got to stop the takedown. So you got either or. And you can't do both. And so the only way to stop that is by hitting him with a strike of your own that's going to stop him in his tracks, stop him from coming forward. But that's easier said than done. Colby Covington's durable. He's tough as nails. He's really hard to, to get out of there because even when he does get rocked and rattled, he bounces back quickly, right? He gets back up. He, he's quick to recover. And even though he is kind of hittable because he's always just going for offense, like I said, the guy can take a punch. So there's that. He's going to put his punches and kicks together as well. That's something we people forget a lot is that Colby Covington will throw the kicks at the end of his punches. And he kind of mixes that in and you think, wow, I forgot Colby Covington was a kicker. Well, he can be, right? Uh, Colby Covington, the pace is really his weapon. And over, uh, over 25 minutes, I don't think there's anybody in the UFC that can put on a pace like Colby Covington. So there's that. When it comes to Leon Edwards... Leon Edwards is a little bit more measured in his approach, right? He's going to pick his shots. He's very accurate. His striking output isn't the highest, but he's, like I said, incredibly accurate, and he prefers to counter strike. He's got good counters. He likes to do that circle off hook. He likes to do the pull one, two. He does those very well. Um, I guess he'd be from the you know, opposite stance, but whatever. He'll do the collar tie into the elbow as guys come in. You know, they'll, they'll press, and that's something he can land on Covington. This right here, the collar tie to the elbow, that is going to be something that when Covington is pressing in, if Edwards is able to lock that up and just boom right in there, just drag him through that elbow, that is something that's going to drop somebody like, like Covington. So this is going to be the best counter for him. The pull one two isn't going to do crap because he's going to try to do the pull one two, and Covington's just going to keep coming forward. So he's going to pull and then, oh, well, he's still on me. It's not like he's throwing a couple of shots and picking, and, you know, Covington just blitz him forward. So it just. 100%. The circle hook, circle off and hook, yeah, okay, that's something, but but pull one two is not going to work super well against a guy like Covington in most instances. That collar tie to the elbow, though, is definitely going to work. Now, problem with the counter striking is a lot of times he can get backed up when doing so, and if he doesn't end up hitting that circle off hook, he ends up backing up a little bit too far. If Covington gets him against the cage, that's a problem. Now, combinations. Dude puts his punches and kicks together in expert combination. He's a very clean striker. Like I said, that that cross to head kick combo that he landed on on Usman is just a classic pinpoint accurate kick after just it, it's just the, it's a great setup that's been around for a long time he just happened to make it super popular because well he knocked out the champion and took it took the belt for himself so there is that in the clinch in the clinch is an interesting area because I think the wrestling style clinch Colby Covington is going to have the advantage but if the, in the tie style clinch you know you get the you know get the nice little tie palm there get the elbows inside and you know back Getting, you know, I'm at the back of the head there, face of the skull. That's where it's going to favor a guy like Edwards. Because he can start landing these elbows from there, just like that, and going right back into that tie clinch. And he does a pretty good job of that. And he has a smooth transition from, from striking range into the clinch, and then back out into striking range. He does that very well. So in the, in the clinch, if you look in tie clinch style, that's the advantage here on the Edwards side. If you're looking at wrestling clinch style, you know, like getting one under, one over, or both under, whatever, like, you know, chest to chest. That's going to be the Covington advantage, right? So the two different styles of clinching are going to be two different styles of, you know, who's going to have the advantage in different styles of fights there. In the grappling, Edwards has good wrestling of his own, and a lot of times he uses a single leg takedown to drive guys up against the cage, and he doesn't even want to take them down necessarily. He wants to get to this, like, half-back position. He wants to get you down to where you're, like, you know, kind of, not, like, quite on all fours, but, like, kind of, like, so-so, sort of. And then he's going to get, like, halfway to your back, and start just landing shots from there with punches, elbows, things like mostly elbows. And he's going to try and trap one of your arms with his. 
So he'll come over and grab that arm. And then he's just going to start ripping elbows from the side that he's controlling the arm with his other side. He does a very good job with it. Now, is he going to do that to Covington? Probably not. But just because of the wrestling style of Covington. But there's a lot of things in Colby Covington's game that, that are going to be negated by Leon Edwards' style. So that's kind of where you get here. These guys have the perfect counter for each other's weapons. And that makes it tough to pick this fight. Obviously, the striker is going to be Leon Edwards going to have the better striking. The wrestling is going to go to the side of Covington. But they each have the good, a good counter to each other's strengths. I tend to favor wrestlers over strikers. And I also tend to really favor guys with really good cardio. I have a hard time not picking Colby Covington in every single one of his fights. And in fact, I think I picked him in the second Usman fight. Uh, the channel wasn't around then, but pretty sure it did. In the first Usman fight, I think I said Usman was going to win. But in the second one, I think I took Covington because of that first fight. And I thought, you know, Covington looked good enough that I think that with just a few tweaks, he could beat Usman. It's pretty close. Do I think he can beat Edwards? Do I think he can do the things differently than Kamara Usman did? That he pushed the pace kind of similar to how Usman did, using that grappling to uh, control and just continually get the takedowns like Usman did in the, in the, I guess it was the second, but the title fight between, the original title fight between Edwards and Usman. I think he can. I'm going to take Colby Chaos Covington to get the win, and I think it's just because he's just going to win at least three of the rounds by just grinding out Edwards. It, just using a grueling pace. Maybe he gets the first, but earlier in the fight, probably I, the fourth and the fifth round, I think are going to Covington. Let's put it that way. He just needs one other round. And the fourth and the fifth, Covington's putting a pace on the guy, and that's what he's going to be able to do. Unless he gets knocked out, which is totally possible. But I'm going to take Colby Chaos Covington to get the win. Let me know who you have. I appreciate you all tuning in. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to be very sad if I don't see many of you during this month away. Most of you only watch my full card breakdowns. The other content on the channel, it's good. Watch it, guys. Watch it. There's, there's a great interview with your boy Eric Anders on the channel. It's fantastic. I'm a big fan of Eric Anders. It's probably going to be at the end screen somewhere. Uh, live streams I did. Uh, me and my buddy Marcus broke down some street fights, which was fantastic. It is an age-restricted video and non-monetizable, so you have to be signed into YouTube, and then like I don't get anything for it if you watch it. But watch it anyway, because it was good content, and Marcus is a likable guy. So watch that stuff. That's the kind of stuff you're going to be getting while, while we're away, because there's just no fights to break down. So do that. Enjoy your time off, and I'll see you guys next year. See you next year. All right, enjoy. Thank you. Appreciate it.